Welcome to the third season of Our Undoing Radio. This season is going to be interviews. It's going to be all interviews about the word sacred. What does it mean? How does it apply? Um, Some of us use it glibly. Some of us use it deeply. And we use it about all sorts of things, right? Places, objects, books. Life itself, we say, is sacred, right? So what is this word sacred? What does it mean? What does it actually mean that any of these things could be sacred? Uh, We're going to be talking to people from all walks of life and various levels of education to cast a wide net and see what we all mean, right? And also, especially, to see the difference uh, in similarity, what the differences and similarities are, I guess, between uh, how... Indigenous people, heart people, and westernized brainiacs process the meaning behind the word. And we'll start off right here in Hawaii with my uh, my friend Lahua, because the Mauna Kea protectors have inspired me to uh, to do this. Um, for those of you who don't know. Here on the island of Hawaii, there's uh, well, there are numerous volcanoes and the. The big three that people talk about are Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea, and Kilauea. Kilauea was uh, the one that was erupting not too long ago, just a a mere handful of months ago. Mauna Loa, which is where I live, is the widest volcano in the world or mountain in the world. And Mauna Kea is the tallest from below sea level on up. Uh, And Mauna Kea, uh, if you don't know, has been in the news because um, a scientific consortium um, led really by the University of Hawaii has been wanting to build a 14th telescope up there, except this one on the summit and larger than the other 13. And it's, um, you know, it's a big deal money project, right? But they're being rebuked by Hawaiian protectors who... um, don't want the sacred land desecrated, right? So what's interesting is, and you know, they call themselves protectors and people in the media would like to call them protesters, but really protectors makes more sense. We were, on the day that we recorded this, we'd just gotten back from being up there. And um, so the access road to even the 13 telescopes is blocked off. No one can go up there, including the protectors. But uh, the protectors are blocking construction of this of this telescope, essentially. And they're doing so by living up there. I mean, they've they've built really a sort of a shanty town, uh, and three times a day they do public ceremony, and I mean it's amazing. It's you're talking hula demonstrations, you're talking chants in the old way, um, the Kapuna, which is the elders, they are there. Uh, leading the way in this. Um, And nothing like this is really, um, well, I don't know if anything like this has been seen. It hasn't been seen in a long time. Let's put it that way. Um, I mean, essentially, the Hawaiians are putting their foot down and saying no more um, because enough of their culture has been taken apart. One step in the name of modernity and jobs at a time, right? So... This is it. This is this is the the last straw for them. And um, again, to go up there, you are seeing protection happen. I mean, you, you sit there, and someone comes up, and um, if they think you're thirsty, they offer you a drink, or maybe they'll offer you sunscreen. There are medical professionals up there volunteering their time to help um, just keep things safe for all of us um, because it's way up high and you're near the sun. <laughs> so this can be problematic if you are unprepared. So it's very peaceful and uh, very nurturing and very loving toward, especially toward elders um, of all people. I mean, not not just the elders uh, who are Hawaiian who are protecting, but anyone who shows up, um, they're very protective of. This is this ain't this ain't your normal protest, folks. Let's put it that way. Um, and they um, they give classes. They hold cultural immersion classes and things like this up there. It, it's just it's an amazing scene to 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 see. 
the organization level is incredible. And again, the love and care and why, because this mountain is sacred. And what does that mean? Um, when I go online, I see all sorts of crazy things that people suppose about what it means. Um, and what else it could mean. Like the science could be sacred. The telescopes could be sacred too, right? We hear this sort of thing. Um, mostly what I hear is that Hawaiians are looking backwards and scientists are looking forward. So we need to look toward the future, not toward these antiquated gods. And all of that is completely irrelevant and missing the point. So with this episode, let's get into the point with my friend Lahua. And this was supposed to be just uh, her and I, and then afterward, uh, we were recording this in front of um, a handful of people, and so I was going to take questions at the end, as you'll hear. But Lahua had other ideas. She decided to sort of take the reins and make the show inclusive, uh, so that it was more, slightly more of a roundtable discussion, at least in the middle. And so for that, uh, I maybe I have to apologize for the audio quality. I'm not sure because I was not prepared for this one little microphone to go around the table. Um, I've tried to equalize out the audio as much as possible, but we'll see what happens. Um, also, during that round table, she asks uh, my friend Kahaya about a place called Hale Akala, which is um, a volcano in Maui. So not, not this island, not the island of Hawaii, but Maui. Just so you know... And for her part, Lahua would like you to know, as she asked me to say after we were done recording, that uh, the ancestors were speaking through her. So this is an amazing whirlwind um, lesson, talk story, as we say in Hawaii, but really a lesson for all of us about what sacred means in the Hawaiian way. And we're going to get into real minutiae. I mean, this isn't going to be some general blather discussion. I think you're really going to get something out of this. And by the end of it, I think you will walk away with a new appreciation for what the Mauna Kea protectors are doing and why. And in fact, you may even understand that the Hawaiian sense of the sacred is ultimately what's being protected and is worth protecting. More so even than our ability to peer into deep space. I mean, right? So let's pick it up with a Lahua telling us what it is we need to know about her that will inform this discussion. Take it away, Lahua. Well, I have two kinds of credentials. I definitely have a Western credential. I have a master's degree in cultural anthropology, and I did uh, major work toward a PhD, and my specialty was indigenous spirituality. So I had the opportunity during my research and my master's work and then my PhD work to interview other indigenous peoples about this very subject of what is sacred. Mm -hmm. And as a master's uh, student and then as a PhD student, I was actually required to read everything I could about indigenous spirituality. You know academics. Books comes first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've got those kinds of credentials. And I've been studying this now for more than 40 years. I also have the credential as, a, as an indigenous person. Not only of being raised in the culture that recognizes the sacred, but also being open to it as a human being and further learning about it and expressing it through my 20 years of hula training, and then now as a kūpuna, as an elder, being able to teach it to the younger generations. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, this, uh, I should say that this is, um, we've got a live audience here, so we may do questions at the end of this if anyone wants to chime in, so that's great. Um, but, it, you know, I was inspired to do this, of course, because of the, the 30 meter telescope uh, protests going on or protecting going on on Mauna Kea. And it's interesting to me that, of course, the protectors are protecting what they say is a sacred space. 
And I've actually heard people who are pro the telescope saying, well, we think it's sacred too. And this would, putting a telescope here would be a great way to honor that. And so it got me to thinking, <laughs> you know, the difference between brain people and heart people, as I keep saying, um, what does sacred mean? What does that actually mean in the various ways that we mean it? And so um, I, I'll ask you, well, I'll ask you this. Do you, when you think about the sacred, do you differentiate between your personal uh, sense of the sacred and the Hawaiian sense, or are they one and the same? Oh, they have to be one and the same. Because I'm immersed in my culture. It's the water I breathe and sleep and eat in. So what I would be considered sacred is what I've been taught by my kupuna, is what I do in recognition and respect of my kupuna, as well as the place that is called sacred, and in respect to my own soul, that I need to recognize and honor and acknowledge the sacred. Yeah, so for me it's all one and the same. Okay, and so in the Hawaiian culture, places are sacred. Um, are objects sacred? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. You can have uh, an object made with uh, feathers from certain birds that are considered uh, more important than others. You can have uh, a drum, a hula drum, that when made is made from the trunk of the coconut tree and then covered with a shark skin uh, drum head and then attached and made firm with the fiber from the inside of the coconut husk. So it is at that point, having just been made, still profane, still free from any restrictions or more importantly, any connections. See, sacred, to be sacred, there must be a connection between who we are as humans and the thing we call or the place we call or even the person we call sacred. Without that connection, that place is not sacred within human understanding. There, it could be sacred for the gods. It could be sacred for the ghosts or the spirits. It could be sacred for the animals. But we don't live in their realms uh, unless we have connections to them and receive their messages and understand what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. But without those connections, there cannot be the sacred. So, okay, so the drum has just been made. Now you make the connections so that that drum can be sacred. First of all, the drum is blessed. The drum is blessed by those that others recognize as having the power, the wisdom, and the authority to bless and give mana, sacredness, to the thing. When that's done, when that drum is properly blessed, and by properly I mean by all the protocol, by what you say about the drum, by what you bring to the drum for that blessing, by the intention of what you want to use that drum for, by those who come to that blessing and bringing their mana and their input into the blessing of that drum. Once that drum is blessed, it's still not sacred yet until it is actually used for the first time. So there are many, many objects that are sacred. It's sacred in the use of its function. Mm -hmm. Now, some objects can be sacred simply because they were made and blessed to be sacred and not touched and put away. But most sacred things that I know have a function. Function for healing, function for fishing, function for all kinds of things. In this case, we're talking about a hula drum, a pahu. So it's been blessed. So comes the performance after the blessing, which is going to be the first time this drum is used. In the performance, that drum is be beaten. It is in that beating that you give voice, that the drum gives voice to what it is. That voice, that beat, that's the connection. Because that's a connection to each of the people in the audience who hear it. That's a connection. That sound is the connection to the dancer. That sound is the connection to the unseen beings, the gods and the spirits. That sound is the connection to the heartbeat 
of the earth. That sound is the connection to the rain that's falling as a blessing on this performance. The wind that comes in to also give its blessing to this performance. The uh, sun that shines or the moonlight that shines on the blessing of this performance. It is only when all of these things have come about that that drum then becomes a sacred thing. Now, it's not sacred 24-7. It's sacred for the performance. It's sacred for the use, its role, its function. But in between times, you put the drum away. Uh, its mana is kept, so you put it in a special place and you cover it with a special covering and children and dogs and cats are not allowed to go near it So because it is put away to be um, conserved for its next performance. In that time, there's still a sacredness about it, which is why you don't want dogs and cats and little kids going toward it. But it is its true sacredness when it functions mm -hmm. in its stated purpose mm -hmm. as, a, um, as a beat and giving voice to the intention of the drummer and the dancers and the chanter and the masters. Yeah, now that's a sacred object. You got sacred objects in peace pipes. You've got sacred objects in, in, in weapons. Oh, a great sacred object. The sword in the stone withdrawn by King Arthur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, think about that. Americans know that story. What made that sword sacred? That sword was made sacred by the lady in the lake who put that sword in the stone in the first place. See what I mean by the purpose and the function and the connection to the unseen, to everything around you. Mm -hmm. Now you want to come to sacred space or sacred place mm -hmm. or sacred site. That's a little different than a sacred object where you can put it away. So when King Arthur puts away the sword, it's still sacred, but not as sacred as when he takes it out and uses it with authority and power. But a sacred place, once it is deemed sacred, retains all its sacredness 24-7. It becomes intrinsically sacred. Not every place is sacred. Not every mountain is sacred. Not every volcano is sacred. But we're looking at the same kind of concepts as in the making of the drum, in the blessing of the drum, in the performance and role of the drum, the connections between that which is not seen, connections with that which is nature, connections with that which is part of the cosmos, and finally the connections back to the human. There has to be connections. So how does a place like Mauna Kea Get to be sacred. Okay, Mauna Kea, let's look at its place on the planet. The very root of Mauna Kea is the hot spot that the, the, the geologists, geologists like to talk about, like the hot spot beneath Yellowstone that creates all the geysers and everything. There is that hot spot, and the, this is the only hot spot in the entire Pacific. So from the deep core, where the magma begins to melt and rise up, come through the various layers of the, of the planet and through what the geologists call the plumbing, come up to the top of Mauna Kea. But as it rises, it pools and creates a magma source beneath the top of the mountain and halfway down and then further down. That magma source is about as large as the entire island itself and probably larger. Because remember, it's also feeding Kilauea, it's also feeding Hualalai, and it's also feeding Mauna Loa. And so we're looking at, you know, most of the island. Now the plumbing, Hawaiians recognize that like a pico, like an umbilical cord. So that the mountain, and here's our first connection, the mountain is like the top of an umbilical cord that's connected to the very center of the earth with the magma from that center rising like blood, 
like sperm, like whatever that umbilical cord carries to the top of the mountain. That connection between the mountain and the center of the earth, that's a really, really special connection. That specialty is what we recognize as sacred. We're not saying it is sacred. We rec- It's already sacred. We recognize its sacredness. And that's what makes it important. The second connection, that mountain stands above the cloud line. It is the nearest thing to the heavens that you can get because it is the tallest thing in the Pacific. So anything that's nearer to heaven than anything else, that is more sacred than what's further down, especially where humans are concerned. So when you get to the golf course and the subdivision, forget it. <laughs> Not that sacred. But the top of that mountain, as close as it is to the cosmos, that makes it sacred because of its connection, its, its position, its location next to the highest thing before you touch the stars. And then, that's the next connection that we can see. And of course, Hawaiians always recognize we have many gods. Gods of the skies, gods of the earth, gods of the rain, gods of the clouds, gods of the streams, gods of the mountains, gods of the earth itself, gods of the moon. The next connection is those clouds. Those clouds produce rain. And they produce it at the highest level because Mauna Kea is at the highest level. So that rain is the most sacred rain in Hawaii because it falls from the highest element to the highest peak of all the islands. There's a lake up there called Lake Waiau. Wai in Hawaiian means fresh water. Waiau refers to, uh, in a sense, mothers make milk. U is breast. And so Waiau is mother's milk. It's the fresh water from the U, from the breast. So therefore, Lake Waiau, all the connotations of mother's milk, what? Nurturing and feeding the baby. Of mother's milk, the English word milk, meaning uh, life and sustenance. That lake is the very first body that receives this very, very sacred rain because it falls through the heavens without any attachment to humans. That lake now becomes sacred. That water in the lake now becomes sacred. So there's a connection from deep within the earth going up to the top of the mountain, then connections from the top of the mountain, from the cosmos down, manifested by the rain that falls first on here before anywhere else. So you're beginning to see all these connections coming. How can we not consider this place sacred? And then you got the rock, the very mountain itself. This is granite. This is the center of the earth coming for. This is the crust of the earth pushing out through Mauna Kea, spreading itself out over the shield volcano taking a very long time to cool. And that length of time to cool means that this rock that shapes Mauna Kea is as, gets harder and harder and harder as it cools. So it is the, the very breast, the very um, body of the earth manifested in this shield volcano. We live on this breast. We live on this body. This is the hardness the very from the very center of the earth. How can we not consider it sacred? The connections of the very bedrock of the planet is what we're standing on or sitting on or lying on or sleeping on or eating from. And it is these connections. But what further makes it sacred is that humans give voice, sound, to the stories of what I just said. That's now what makes it sacred to humans. Until you heard my story, 
Did you know what made Mauna Kea sacred? Until you heard my story about the connections, did you know that there were even connections that we recognize as humans to our gods, to the spirits of the magma, of the center of the earth, of the cosmos, of the rain, of the clouds, of the very body of the planet? That's what's beginning to make this sacred. And then we manifest the connections. Remember, our, we back, go back to our drum. Now comes the performance of the drum where everybody can see it and hear it and touch it and, and, and dance to it and celebrate it. Okay, so here comes a bunch of humans from the South Pacific 2,000 years ago, and they see this magnificent mountain. <sighs> I need to ask you, Mary, Tell me again your description of your feelings and your, um, your feelings when you finally saw Mauna Kea for the first time today. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. This is Jerry, Jeremy's mother. This is Mary Vaney. I want to introduce. She's, she's um, a sister from, a, from, a, from another father. <laughs> Yeah, I saw Mauna Kea for the first time today, and I think partly because of its shape. Um, you described it as a shield mountain. It's so broad and so beautiful, and it just emotes power and magnificence. It's awesome. It's awe-inspiring. It brings tears to your eyes. How could anyone not know that this is a special place? Yeah, yeah. It's that sense of awe yeah. and wonder and magnificence. Mm -hmm. How did it make you feel? I felt as though I was in the presence of greatness, which I was. And I felt humbled um, by it and um, moved by it. Yeah. It's that sense of humility that I want to get at now. So that when we come to Mauna Kea and we begin to recognize it, and we, we climb the mountain for the first time, what we do as humans, or what my ancestors, I'm assuming my ancestors did this 2,000 years ago, was they looked at it with the same eyes as you did, they looked at it with the same feelings as you did, they looked and described it with the same words in their language as you just described. And then they began to sing and dance what you saw today and then they began to worship and bow down and then they began in their humility to give it all this respect that's the manifestation of the connections between humans and all of these other beings and spirits and gods that i've just been talking about and now the story is manifest in the performance of that hula, in the performance of that song, in the performance of the words that gave voice that you just did, you just made that place sacred because you gave human voice to its um, magnificence mm. and its relationship and connection to connections to the gods. Bingo. <laughs> wow. My job is done here. <laughs> Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you know, I, thank you. I, I haven't had to ask anything because you pretty much run down an itinerary for me. Oh, um, but well, there there's, one, there's a lot more to talk about. I'm but, sure. But go ahead. Yeah. There, well, there's one thing I want to ask you about our interconnecting with a, a sacred place like Mauna Kea, which is um, those songs, those chants, the, the rituals, the spots that people even pick on the mountain to be specific spots to do some of these things around the mountain. Does that come from the land itself? Does that come from the people purely? Or is there an interplay between, you know, elements and maybe voices or, you know, something else at play here? In, in other words, does the mountain itself, does Mauna Kea itself need a specific type of interaction that it asks from people and maybe not literally asks, but in an intuitive way, you know, sort of thing? Um, is, is that how that comes about or is that a bridge too far? It's the other way around. Mauna Kea asks nothing of us. It exists. 
it is real, it is manifest, it is itself. But we as humans, we need these connections. We ask Mauna Kea to allow us to go there, to allow us to sing and dance, to allow us to give voice to its magnificence. It's magnificent whether or not humans are there. But we as humans need that physical touch, smell, taste, connections. Mm -hmm. We as humans must have the stories. Without those stories, that those connections do not exist. And those stories are in the dances you saw today, the hulas you saw today. Those stories are in all the chants you heard today. The stories are in all the beats of the drums. The drums were absolutely magnificent today. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll bet that you saw something similar at Haleakala. What did you see? Oh, you better introduce her. Kahaya, everybody. Kahaya. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, well, I think from the moment you you decide you're going to go, it's already begun. The energy and the... Um, it's all in your intention, I think, because the the drive up, you know, you, if you go up for sunrise, you're already committed, and it's um, very, it's just a different space that you're in, and I know many times <clears throat> I've had um, a, a pueo or an mm -hmm. owl fly in front of my car as oh. I was driving up, so to me that always was... Um, very symbolic yeah. and of something, you know, a deeper, a deeper experience that's unfolding. And um, to be on top of um, Haleakala um, is just really, really special. Um, yeah, it's palpable energy and um, it's the magnitude is, yeah, it's really, it's hard to put into words, but yeah. Yeah. And then we got one more voice. Well, actually, we have two more voices, but um, we want to ask Ignacio <laughs> his feelings when he came to this place. What did, what did it make you feel like? This place being the Big Island? Or Ka'u, oh. or your property, mm -hmm. or Mauna Kea, whatever you choose. I think the most profound experience I've had of of Hawaii and also of this area <clears throat> is the uniqueness of it. And what I came to understand was that this is a wild place. Ooh. This is an untamed place. And she allows us to be here. And she gives us a certain part of herself to be here. She being who? She being the, the spirit of the island, Pele. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's so different from the mainland because in the mainland we have tamed the land, but here the land is not tamed. And so we must fit into the space that she allows us to be. It's very, very different. And because of her uniqueness, I must be in touch with my uniqueness to be here. If I'm unable to be in touch with what is unique and sacred about myself in order to find my place in the space that she allows me to be here, there's no way I can be here. She's far too unique, far too, far too sacred to allow anything else. I, you know, I've heard all these stories about people come, they think, oh, I'm going to move to Hawaii, and they come, and then they leave. And I've thought a lot about that because I didn't know if I would come and have to leave. And that's what I finally came to understand was required is for me to be in touch with what is uniquely sacred about myself in order to merge with what is uniquely sacred about this place. Yeah. yeah. He touched on, oh, Ignacio touched on two very, very important concepts. The concept of uniqueness, the concept of, of differentness, the concept of, of this is somehow different in 
a very um, special way than what I'm used to. And then the second concept was fitting in. Americans have the sense that they conquer, mm. they take dominion mm. over the earth. Mm. They come into a place and they take control and they mold it into what they see mm. that place should be. Mm. You don't come mm. to an active volcano thinking you can take control and mold it to your purposes. And that's different. It's a very un-American thing to come to a place and change yourself to fit into it. It's a very different kind of concept to be humble enough to come to a place and begin to understand that you got to fit in and not the other way around. And that's really critical. That's really critical to what's happening. Haleakala is another sacred place. Hale, house, akala, house of the sun. How wonderful, how beautiful, how incredible can that be? Because it's pure light. And that's so important. Mauna Kea, on the other hand, Mauna Awa Kea, which is one of the names that we call the mountain, uh, Mauna Awakea, Mauna Kea being mountain white, referring to the snow that falls on Mauna Kea during cold, uh, any time during the winter time. Mauna Awakea being the homelands of Wakea. Wakea is one of many gods of the cosmos of the heavens, of the sky, and it's definitely a male. But Mauna Kea and Mauna Awa Kea also has female, also have female connections. First of all, the connection to Papa, and don't be, don't get confused. I use the word Papa, but I'm not talking about uh, an English father. Papa just happens to be the name of an earth mother. Not the earth mother, we have many earth mothers, but one of several earth mothers. Haumea, for instance, is another earth mother. So we have uh, Mauna Kea or Mauna Awa Kea being the place that we attribute both Papa and Wakea, the earth and the sky. But Mauna Kea Mauna, the White Mountain, is also a connection to the snow and the cold and the sleet and the ice. And that is the manifestations of a goddess named Poliahu. So Poliahu, you can touch her. She's cold. She's wet. She's snow. She's ice. She's chill. She's um, sleet. Everything cold. Everything snow. And that's a whole different con kind of connection. It's a whole different sense of being. So now you begin to see with the people of, that you just heard, the sacred is part of these connections that we experience as humans. So are there places that are sacred without us? Yes. Every place that we're, humans have not come to is sacred in its own intrinsic right. When does a place become sacred to us? When we, as humans, recognize its uniqueness and we recognize our humility and we recognize our intentions to that place and then we give voice, we give story. If there are no stories that are passed on generation to generation, that place is no longer sacred. How can it be? Because nobody knows why. Nobody knows the intention of that place as being sacred because the stories have been lost. So if the mountain becomes overcrowded with telescopes, then we begin to lose the connections with the heavens, the cosmos, the rain, the clouds, the very body of the earth, the conduits of magma that come up through the hot spot, the, the connections to the center of the earth, 
If we don't give voice to these stories, and it's only the telescopes up there looking for the truth. <laughs> oh dear, those poor people. <laughs> They're so confused about the truth. <laughs> if we don't give voice to those stories, and only the telescopes get to tell their story, which, by the way, I'm so sorry, is so limited. These poor astronomers, they're so narrow-minded and limited in their storytelling. So they're like children that's opening up a present, which are, of course, the cosmos. And they get to see only parts of the cosmos through their instruments. That's, how, that's why they're narrow-minded, because they only trust what they can see through the glass. Yeah. So, uh, and because they only see through the glass and they can only see this little bit of the gifts that are being unfolded through their telescopes, their stories are very limited. And they only tell stories through numbers, math, measurements of light through their spec spectroscopes, uh, measurements of time through the refraction of the light from the different stars. Not enough, not enough if we allow only telescopes to get up there and we allow only their stories to be told, then we lose the complete and incredible and expansive and magnificent mm -hmm. sacredness mm -hmm. of that mountain. It's probably the perfect place to leave this. But selfishly, I want to ask you another question. And sure. maybe I'll edit it there and that'll be the end, but I don't know. Um, which is just, you know, listening to you and any indigenous person speak, it's clear from the, the details that in another language, in scientific language, you would be considered scientists. You're making observations. You're living through these observations. You are at one with these observations. And that's why they're so detailed. And, and, yet, and yet science, uh, you know, it, it, it just boggles my mind that somehow th there's this thing called science that is supposedly, uh, you know, the pinnacle of what we can do with the rational mind. And the rational mind, of course, is everything. Um, and so, you know, how many things have I seen online about um, Hawaiians who don't want the telescopes up there are going backwards and science is looking forwards. But listening to you speak, it's clear that you, again, if you put this in, in, in technical language, these chants, these songs, th these revelations about the natural world, that is science. So how did we come to this place of arrogant separation? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Let me clear up one thing. This issue is not about science versus spirituality. This issue is about building a building on a sacred site versus the sacredness of that spirituality. It's not science we're opposing. It's the goddamn building. How clear can I see? We're talking about a building that's at least 18 stories and taller, which will make it the tallest building on this whole island. We're talking about a mirror that's more than 96 feet in diameter. You take your house and you triple it in one direction, and that's the size of the mirror alone. We're talking about a computer annex building next to the telescope 18 stories that's twice as long as the telescope is high so that it can house all the computer equipment. We're talking about having to build a power plant right on the footprint of where they have the telescope because this telescope will use more electricity than all the other 13 telescopes combined. And then we're not, ta we're not including the parking lot or the trash bins, or the, all the other human-built environment to support this. We oppose golf courses on sacred sites. We oppose subdivisions on sacred sites. We oppose shopping centers on sacred sites. Why, won't, why can't we oppose a, a huge industrial complex complex. Let's be clear, people. This is an industrial complex. I don't care what its function is. It could be an 18-story hotel 
free to all people who are uh, dis disabled with free medical and free meals for the rest of their lives, and I would still oppose it. Why? Because it is the imposition of a human-built environment that destroys the integrity of the sacredness of the spirituality at that top. This is not an issue of science versus spirituality. This is an issue of an industrial complex, glass, concrete, steel, and asphalt, built without permission, built without consideration to what the land is, built with the destruction of the land to make it level to build the buildings, built six acres is the footprint of this telescope alone. So when we talk about this as a spiritual issue for us, it's not a spiritual issue versus science. It's a spiritual issue versus the destruction of the sacred. With no regard for what the sacred means, no permission, no approval, and no consideration at all for any of the connections between what is below. Ho, ho, ho. What if Marokea erupts? Ha, 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 ha. And it's a dormant volcano. The last eruption was, yes, a thousand years ago, which, of course, in scientific terms is a long, 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 long time ago. But in human terms is a blink of an eye. We know we're volcanic people. We know that, we, that a thousand years is not long enough to call it more than, than active. So this is a place that is being destroyed by wanton disregard of other people's understanding of why this place must be kept the way it is. You know? Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Well, Lahua, thank you for doing this. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me go on and on and on. No. And explain, because I, I, I don't get this opportunity. And, and Americans don't, also don't have this opportunity to hear this kind of knowledge from indigenous peoples. And it's important because as long as Americans keep destroying their lands and, dis and polluting their waters and scraping off their mountains and mining copper, gold, and silver in the bosom of the earth, they are destroying their own great-grandchildren's future. That's what I worried about. I'm not worried about the Americans living today. I worried about their great-grandchildren. The water they're going to drink, the land they're going to uh, live on, the air they're going to breathe, the food they're going to eat. We're only contaminating. We're only making things worse. We're not making things better. And that's our responsibility. That's what we've got to do. So if we can stop this monstrosity, and I'm not talking about science, I'm talking about the goddamn building. The industrial complex. If we can stop this monstrosity of, a, of, a, of an industrial complex, we will have saved the mountain for the future. And that's the point. You want to find your truth? Go find it someplace else. Put another satellite in space. Get better views up there anyway.